Hey, good morning, Tri-Cities Christian Church. Hope you are all doing well. Before I uh, jump into the message, happy birthday to Olivia. Love you, babe. Um, so we're going to continue our uh, discussion out of the book of Colossians. The title of our series is uh, Christ Over Everything. And today, sacrifice is going to be the name uh, of, of today's lesson. Before we uh, kind of get um, going, as always, please don't get distracted by me looking over here because that's just kind of where I have my notes. And um, that's it. So kind of, so sacrifice, right? Um, I love the movie Saving Private Ryan. I'm not sure if you've seen it. Um, I'm not a big fan of blood and uh, blood and guts, but what I really love about the movie Saving Private Ryan is the camaraderie and the teamwork all because these guys were dedicated to a call that was greater to them and caused them to sacrifice so the whole idea behind saving private ryan was um captain miller who was played by tom hanks was asked to lead his squad into deep um, into the front where, where, where fighting was very, very intense to save Private Ryan. Private Ryan was one of four brothers. He was the last surviving brother. The other three had already died um, fighting in World War II. And if Private Ryan were to pass, if he were to die, his last name Ryan would cease to exist and the Ryan family would cease to exist. So Tom Hanks leads his dudes um, into deep, heavy fighting, um, and some people lost their life along the way. And the main thing here is that when something is extremely valuable, it's worth sacrificing for, even if it means losing yourself in the process, because the outcome of the sacrifice results in greater glory. And today, we're going to talk about that, but I believe all of us at some, you know, at some level, um, all really love a moving story of sacrifice. Maybe you've actually lived it out. Maybe you have done something or you know somebody um, that has done something very sacrificial. Maybe something has been done for you that was sacrificial, or maybe you've really sacrificed. Um, I think kind of at the core of it, is that every individual wants to be called higher to do something that's worth sacrificing for because it's something that's it's greater than ourselves you know if we kind of just live our lives day to day um it's a blessing it's great but when we get a higher calling when we're called to do something that's bigger than ourselves i think it brings the best out of us yes it can be scary but I think it's worth it at the same time. And so today, what I want you to kind of have at the, uh, at the front of your mind as kind of the overarching idea is that um, the value of the gospel of Jesus is worth sacrificing for. The value of the gospel is worth sacrificing for. Let's open up our Bibles to Colossians chapter one. I'm gonna read verses 24 all the way through two, chapter 2, verse 5, and see if you are able, as we're going through here, to identify elements of sacrifice. And I also want to say on the front end that there is so much in this passage, and I'm just going to do my best to give us an overview to help us to understand some ideas more. Um, but any individual that is studying this out could probably pull out just, I don't know, dozens of, you know, extra messages. So um, let's get right into it here. Colossians chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 24. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you. And he's speaking to the church in Colossae, as well as the church in Laodicea. Uh, Laodicea, pardon me, basically just kind of the churches right here in this region. And I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, which is the church. 
I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentile, Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one that we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we present everyone fully mature in Christ. To this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. I want you to know how hard I'm contending for you and for those in Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom all things, pardon me, in whom are, pardon me again, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine sounding arguments. For though I am absent with you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. A lot of stuff there. Let me just scroll down a bit, my friends. So Paul starts this passage by letting the church know that he is rejoicing for his sufferings. At this point in time, he's being held in jail. So that's kind of what he's referring to about his, uh, about his sufferings. And he surrendered, fully surrendered to his calling as a servant, his commission to preach the word in its fullness. Paul was not going to hold anything back. In essence, Paul, he understands that sacrifice comes with the call and he embraces that. He doesn't have any regrets. There's no resentment for him being in jail because of his commission to preach the word. Why is Paul able to be so surrendered, so at peace, and so powerful in his faith? Because Paul, like Jesus, kept the long game in mind. What is the long game? The long game is that the result of his commission will lead many to salvation, including himself, even though he would suffer in the short term. Paul was not concerned about what was going to happen to him today. Paul was looking at, hey, if it means, if my life means that I have to sacrifice for the benefit of other people making it to heaven, then so be it. Paul's faith gave him perspective. And I think that's a takeaway that all of us can apply. Our faith can give us perspective for where we are currently at in life if we're looking at the long game and the choices that we're making now will benefit us, but also those in our life. Now, preaching the word in its fullness is also about clearing up mysteries. So if you are like me, you might have spent a long time wondering what this mystery is that Paul is mentioning in the book of Colossians. Maybe you're still wondering what this mystery is. Let me clarify it for you. The Greek word uh, translated to mystery here means something previously unknown, but now revealed truth. Something that was previously unknown, but is now a revealed truth. And the Greeks, they talked much about mysteries. Mysteries to the Greek world were a big thing. And in this case, Paul takes their word mystery and uses it for the gospel. This contrasted with the Colossian heretics notion that a mystery was a secret teaching known only to an exclusive group and unknown to the masses. And we're going to circle back to that a little bit later 
um, in chapter two when it talks about fine sounding um, arguments, but keep that there um, for yourself to kind of learn about. The mystery, okay, this is where things get really cool. The mystery was not that the Gentiles would be saved. That was common knowledge, but how they could be fellow heirs on the same levels, on the same level, pardon me, with the Jewish people. There was going to be no middle wall of partition between them. No middle wall separating Gentiles and the Jewish nation. There was no wall there anymore. It was God is bringing both people together. As mentioned, God saving the Gentiles, that was not a new revelation, but that he would dwell within the Gentiles and deal with them on the same basis as he did the Jews. This was a new revelation to everyone at the time. This was part of the gospel of Christ uniting all people. This was a groundbreaking teaching. Uh, if you were to send a text message to the Jewish people, they would have replied back with the mind blown emoji. This was something absolutely new um, and uh, is something that they just were, this was something that was just, man, earth shattering for their culture and for the, for the Judaic religion. Paul was clarifying that God showed his deep sacrificial love for all people, not just a special group. All people were, were all people were going to be a part of the kingdom, which meant that one group was not going to be better than another group and thus exclude others. Sound familiar? This is a timeless message that is rooted in Jesus. The kingdom is a special place where the world's boundaries and prejudices, they die. Within Christ, the world's boundaries and prejudices, they die because Jesus is Lord of his people. In the kingdom, Jesus is Lord. And uh, God's people are not held, nor do they need to abide by the separation that the world will try to put on its people. The kingdom is a place of unity and love in Christ. Amen. So then Paul, going a little bit deeper here to talk about this mystery, shares the true value of it, which is Christ in you. Christ is in you, he's telling the Colossian church. Now, Christ in you is, pardon me, let me back up here. Your position in Christ, okay, I'm going to tell you two things here. Your position in Christ is your acceptance before God, assurance of salvation, and your identity. So that's your position, um, that's your position in Christ. Now, Christ's position in you, Christ in you, means new life, being regenerated, power for living, the basis of a relationship with God, plus promise and hope, the hope of glory. And when an individual makes Jesus Lord and is baptized, they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is a deposit or a down payment on your salvation, giving an assurance of the completion of God's work in your life. So when you die, God wants that deposit back. So let me kind of circle back there. We have our position, uh, there's Christ's position in your life, but then there's Christ's position in you. Both are blessings, but Christ being in you, that is the mystery being explained. That's where all the high value was. So let me kind of continue on here with what Paul is aiming to do. That is the message that Paul is proclaiming, admonishing, and teaching to the Colossian church. Let's break that down. Proclaiming, that word is translated as announcing the good news. Admonishing, urging people earnestly. He's basically saying, 
Guys, this is an awesome gift. Come get it. Teaching, telling people how this thing works. Guys, if you want this gift, you can repent, which means you transform your being by transforming your thinking and who you are loyal to. You are no longer going to be loyal to the ruling elite of that day. Your allegiance is now going to be to Christ. Then you make Jesus Lord and you are baptized. So he explains the, 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 the mystery of Christ being in you. And he's saying, this is what I'm trying to proclaim to everyone, what I'm admonishing everyone to take advantage of. And I'm teaching people how to take advantage of this awesome gift. He's doing this because he wants everyone to have a mature, which means a complete faith in Christ. Mature means complete. He's trying to fill in the blanks for people to understand Jesus more fully. Again, another takeaway for us to apply to our lives here as a modern day disciple and Christian. So he cares so deeply about the faith of the disciples in this region that he is strenuously contending for them. Paul loves these guys. Let's unpack this idea of strenuously contending um, for the faith. The Greek word Paul chooses translates as uh, translated uh, contending earnestly usually describes an athlete striving with extreme intensity to win the victory in a physical competition. So I'm quite sure. So if you guys didn't know, Allie Benton, she used to row for the UW rowing team. And I would imagine that when Allie and her team stepped into her boat and they were going into a race, every single person on that team was competing. They were strenuously contending for that victory as an athlete. They were gonna leave it all on the water. They can't leave it on the field because they're on the water. The Amplified Bible translate the command as fight strenuously for the defense of the faith. So what was happening? Paul is concerned because the faith, the Christian message of the gospel is under attack by false teachers there in the church in Colossae and Laodicea. And they're spreading dangerous heresies, AKA fine sounding arguments. And Paul tells his reader that he is contending for the faith against those who are seeking to undermine the gospel of Jesus. Now, this is where the message translates from chapter one into chapter two. So in verse one, he wants them to know how hard he's contending and why he's contending for the faith, because he wants them to be encouraged in heart, united in love, and have the full riches um, of complete understanding so that they can know Christ. He's contending, he's fighting against fine sounding arguments because he wants them to be encouraged in heart, united in love and understand Christ fully because in Christ are the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So we can basically understand more and more as we continue to dig and discover more and more of what Christ has to offer us day after day. The riches of Christ never run out. It's something that we can continue to understand. It's like a, a, an, an onion with unlimited layers. You can keep peeling it back, peeling it back, because what is good for you today is not what's going to be good for you tomorrow. And you can continue to evolve in your faith to become more and more like Jesus as you progress in your journey with Christ. Um, in essence, if you wanted to kind of really get fun with it, we can all become spiritual archaeologists, continue to dig for the treasures of Christ. We'll be a bunch of 
disciples looking like Indiana Jones. Shout out to, uh, to Dan Keller here. He's already got the Indiana Jones hat. Dan, if you got a moment, pull it out, put it on for us. What's the reason for, what is the reason for, uh, for telling them? Why is this so important? And why should we care in 2020 living in the Tri-Cities? So that they would not be derailed by fine sounding arguments. And so we should not be derailed by fine sounding arguments and the pull of the requirements that were being said. See, the fine sounding arguments were coming from two sides. The first side was a group called the Gnostics. I'm not going to get too far into it, but what I will tell you is that the Gnostics believed and they said that knowledge would lead to salvation. And if you remember what I said earlier about the mystery, the Gnostics believed that only a select few could have this knowledge that would lead to salvation. And Paul was like, no, this is for everybody. The other side were the Jews who were basically saying that you need to um, adhere to the Judaic requirements in order to receive salvation. So these disciples, these Christians were trying to fought off, fight off these heresies coming from the Gnostics as well as as well as the Jews um, uh, that were also um, around them at that point in time. So as you're reading the Bible and they're talking about fine sounding arguments or heresies, these are the two typical things that we find within the New, the New Testament. There's others, but those are the two main ones. How does this apply to us, brothers and sisters? Fine sounding arguments today could look like political rhetoric coming from both sides, among other things that we kind of deal with. Um, the media is always trying to pull us one way or another. And if you are not rooted in your relationship with Christ, it is very easy to get distracted or pulled one way or another. And that's why this message is so timely for us. What other fine sounding arguments can be um, Purple for us. False doctrines that come from the, from, from the religious world. What are some false doctrines that we may deal with from time to time and that we hear about? A prosperity gospel. Teachings on the end times. Praying Jesus into our hearts. These fine sounding arguments and false doctrines, they're all dangerous because they, from time to time, they can all sound attractive but all of them are hollow and deceptive. And that's why it's so important for myself and for you to be skilled and um, put in the time to be rooted in Christ as you're digging for the treasures of wisdom that come from Jesus. So let's take a moment to consider this. I've already mentioned that Paul made a specific point to tell the church what he was trying to help them to avoid and why he was contending for them. But at a deep level, he was consumed for their well-being that, that comes from a rooted faith in Jesus. He wasn't contending for, he was not contending for his physical freedom because Paul was already free. Paul may have been in jail and physically in chains, but spiritually, Paul was free as a bird. There was no holding him down. And looping back to one of my first points is that his faith gave him perspective. He was able to see beyond the four corners, the four, the four corners and the four walls of the cell that he was being held in. Paul's faith was so rooted that for him to sacrifice for others and their well-being basically became second nature. I'm not saying that he enjoyed jail, but what I firmly believe that it did give him joy to hear and to see others thrive in Christ, even though it meant him sacrificing himself for their, for, for their well-being. Pardon me. So we've discussed a lot, and as I mentioned earlier, there is a lot to talk about here, 
I wasn't able to go too far in because we're just kind of giving an overview and please do your own Bible study on anything that kind of jumped out at you. But how can we apply this? How can we apply this idea of sacrifice and these other things that were kind of outlined here? I'm going to go over three practicals that I believe can help you and your faith and in your relationships. I encourage you to follow through with this. Um, discuss it with somebody in the fellowship. So practical number one. Reflect on your connection to Christ and ask, is your faith giving you the type of perspective that allows you to live with purpose despite unfavorable circumstances? Is your faith at a point right now to, that allows you to live with purpose despite unfavorable circumstances you may have in your life? Paul's unfavorable circumstances was that he was in jail, but his faith gave him perspective and still allowed him to live with purpose. Practical number two, reflect on the statement that Paul makes Christ in you. Christ is in you. How does that change how you see yourself in the eyes of God? And how does that change how you see your brothers and sisters in Christ. Basically, does that help you to see how valuable you are and how valuable your relationships are in the kingdom when Christ, when you see the Christ in yourself and Christ in others? Number three, what type, um, sorry, what was I saying here? How would your relationships look and what type of relationships would you have if you knew or if people knew and felt that you were contending for them? How would your relationships look if people knew that you were contending for them? That's a good question. Would you be willing to go through unfavorable circumstances for their benefit? So based on these three questions and these three kind of ways to look at things, how would your faith grow? How would you change? How would our fellowship look by applying these things? Let me share a story with you. This is going to be a long one as we transition into communion and wrap up the, uh, the main message here today. The story really um, captures the idea of sacrificing very, very well. The story I'm going to read, I'm reading from the first person, and it's a father who has two kids named Ellen, Helen, who is eight years old, and Brandon, he's five. So again, from the first person. I took Helen and Brandon to the Cloverleaf Mall in Hatesburg to do a little shopping. As we drove up, we spotted a Peterbilt 18-wheeler parked with a big sign on it that said, Petting Zoo. The kids jumped up in a rush and asked, Daddy, Daddy, can we go? Please, 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 can we go? We want to pet the animals. Of course, I said, flipping them both a quarter before walking to Sears. So obviously, this is before <laughs> Sears encountered bankruptcy. So the kids, they bolted away. And I felt free to take my time looking for, uh, looking for a new saw. A petting zoo consists of a portable fence erected in the mall with about six inches of sawdust and a hundred little furry baby animals of all kinds. Kids pay their money and stay in the enclosure enraptured with the squirmy little critters while their moms and dads go shopping. A few minutes later, I turned around and I saw Helen walking along behind me. I was shocked to see that she preferred the hardware department to the petting zoo. Recognizing my error, I bent down and asked her what was wrong. She looked up at me with those giant brown eyes and said sadly, Well, Daddy, it cost 50 cents, so I gave Brandon my quarter. 
Then she said the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. She repeated our family motto. The family is, the family is love is action. She had given Brandon her quarter and no one loves cuddly furry creatures more than Helen. She had watched Sandy take, uh, take my stake and say, love is action. She had watched both of us do and say, love is action for years around the house and around our ranch. She had heard and seen love is action. And now she had incorporated it into her little lifestyle. It had become a part of her. What do you think I did? Well, not what you might think. As soon as I finished my errands, I took Helen back to the petting zoo. We stood by the fence and watched Brandon go crazy petting and feeding the animals. Helen stood with her hands and chin resting on the fence and just watched Brandon. I had 50 cents burning a hole in my pocket. I had never offered it to Helen and she never asked for it because she knew the whole family motto. It's not love is action. It is love is a sacrificial action. Love always pays a price. Love always costs something. Love is expensive. When you love, benefits accrue to another's account. Love is for you. It's not for me. Love gives. It doesn't grab. Helen gave her quarter to Brandon and wanted to follow through with her lesson. She knew she had to taste the sacrifice. She wanted to experience that family motto, love is a sacrificial action. Brothers and sisters, the message of Jesus' death for our sins is a message of sacrificial action, isn't it? And it's a message that is best lived out in the lives who have received that message. In other words, the sacrifice, um, the sacrifice should not stay dead, but it should, it should live on and be reflected in the lives of those who have made Jesus Lord of their life. And today, as we take communion, the, the bread that we take, rep, uh, when we break it, represents Jesus' broken body for us. And the juice that we take represents the blood that was spilt for us on the cross. Let's take that with deep gratitude for the gift of our sins being taken away, but also for the gift of the deposit of Christ being given to us as we wait for the hope of glory. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for the opportunity to take a moment and reflect on the message and the mystery of Christ being in us. Who are we, God, that you are so mindful of us, mindful of us, that Lord, you will be so filled with love and being so willing to sacrifice to have us being reconciled back to you and giving us the deposit so that we may be found by you in glory again. Thank you, Lord, as we take the bread and the juice to give us an opportunity to commune together as a fellowship, but to commune with you in this special moment as we remember Jesus. Lord, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. We'll continue on with our worship service.